wait uh, a few seconds and then we shall start. Oh. All right, let's get started. So I'm Jan Vitek, I'm hosting this Ask Me Anything session with Guy Steele. Uh, Guy is, um, is well known. There are the cases where you say, uh, you know, introductions are unnecessary. I, I'll just say that Guy has worked on many of the programming languages we use. So he has, he has worked on from the seventies on pretty much all the brands of Lisp that I heard of, um, on Fortran and parallelizing compilers for Fortran on C on Java, and then he's worked on the language Fortress. There's been uh, another language he's worked on more recently, the Ogre. And I don't know what, what, what is your last area of investigation. So Guy has a wide breadth of knowledge in our field. And uh, this session is dedicated to audience questions. So without further ado, I will start reading some of the questions and we'll see where this takes us. So um, one question that was asked by John Wickers, Wickerson from Imperial College London. John says, I enjoyed reading about your Telnet song, which is the only song I know with exponential time complexity. Are there any other topics in programming languages that you feel or have felt tempted to write songs about? And he has a link to the song. <laughs> and the answer is no. Um, that song was written as a very particular reaction to a, another paper that was written up on the subject of the computational complexity of songs, uh, which I, was, I recall has Knuth's name on it. And, uh, and uh, this article had remarked that there don't seem to be any songs of exponential complexity. So it seemed clear to me that one, at least one ought to be written. And, but I didn't want to just write a song about nothing. I wanted to have a, some lyrics that motivated the, the, the exponential complexity. And this really was a phenomenon that when you uh, used Telnet to uh, connect from one computer to another, there are these escape characters. And I had in real life had occasion to chain that and realize that I was having to double the number of escape characters. Uh, for each Telnet link I set up. And suddenly, bingo, I realized that I actually had some legitimate subject matter for a song. And then throwing a song together didn't take that long, and I think it shows. But amazingly That's enough, um, short, and so I sent it off to, to Knuth to say, you know, here's an example of an exponential song, isn't this funny? And as it turns out, at about that time, he was asked to republish his original article. And he said, oh, and so he told CACM, oh, then there's this sheet music, you should probably publish that too. Oh, he kind of did me a favor there, but it was just one of those one-off things. Was it ever performed? Oh, yes. Um, you may be able to find it on the internet. I know that uh, a performance of it was done at Indiana University as part of a celebration of a new hall opening, as I recall. It's been a while. And they sent me a, uh, a video recording of them performing the song. So that may be kicking around online. Oh. <laughs> And I think the other part of the question was, was there any other topics you feel should be put into song in our field in programming languages? Sure. How about a song about which is better, cock or lean, and why? <laughs> that sounds like something I, I will better not touch. I, I can uh, be a random idea generator, and I've got no theory about what a song like that would be about. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, th another question that was asked by William Wang, he, he writes, there have been efforts to add support for programming persistent memory in C, Java, Golang, specifically to add support for failure as atomicity, memory management for persistent memory, memory position independent addressing, ETC. What are your views on supporting programming for persistent memory in functional programming languages? Oh, goodness. I've not done a great deal of work on persistent memory. I admire the people who do do that. I think it's a difficult subject. In fact, I've got colleagues in Oracle Labs who have been, are much more expert than I uh, on that. 
So just by being around them, I know the depth of my ignorance on that topic. The one thing that strikes me is that there may be a relationship between how persistent memory should relate to a functional programming language and how databases should uh, uh, relate to a functional programming language in, in as much as a database behaves somewhat like a persistent memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that there are language designers such as Rich Hickey who's worked on Clojure and uh, which comes with this datomic package for databases. Yep. So maybe there are some lessons to be learned from there that can be transferred to persistent memory. I don't know, that's the best idea I've got. So in, in Fortress, there was a transactional facility, uh, yeah. you but you never sort of pushed that in the direction of supporting persistence or any other database properties? We never got to the point where we could experiment with that. That's right. And that's in part because uh, we were a language in search of, of hardware to support it. It was part of a big project that was supposed to build a petasized uh, computer. Mm. Uh, it's one of you know three DARPA uh, funded projects to do that. Um, the others were done by Cray and IBM. And uh, we were following what we thought were the design trends in hardware and at the time and we were merely trying to support those at the language level. And uh, as Doug Lee commented in his Ask Me Anything session, mm -hmm. you know, whatever happened to transactions and, and uh, transactional memory, you know, it seemed like a, a, an idea with a lot of buzz in the last decade and uh, we're not talking about it much anymore. So if that had gone somewhere, then we might have tagged along with that language if the language had gone anywhere. But there it is. Yeah. So to build to 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 push a, a little bit on on the fortress theme, uh, Abhirup Sarkar from Chalmers University is asking: Are there any lost ideas from fortress you would wish to see in modern parallel languages? Um, I think of two. One of which has to do with the parallelism. I think Fortress made an honest effort to make parallelism be the default and to have to make an extra effort to make something uh, be sequential. And I think that is remains an incomplete experiment that I would like to see, you know, tried further. I don't think Fortress had a, made a definitive uh, uh, answer on that question. But just the fact that we, we, you know, for decades we've been stuck in a sequential mindset and one of the goals of Fortress is try to nudge us out of that mindset. The other thing that's in Fortress that I think is worth carrying forward is um, getting rid of the idea of a precedence hierarchy that's identified by numbered levels. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a matter of syntax rather than a, yep. a, a semantics. And I, I think that was a good idea that was underappreciated. Right. At least I would like to, I'm hoping to find another language designer in the future who will appreciate that aspect of the design. And what was the benefit of, of getting rid of the precedence levels? The benefit was to force programmers to use parentheses whenever there was any doubt. Mm -hmm. And there is so often doubt, what is, the rel what is the relative precedence between a comparison operator and um, the and or or operators? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a trick question. Am I talking about the regular bitwise and and or operators or the conditional ones? Mm -hmm. And in fact, those are at different places in the C hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so those are things that programmers are, are, are find hard to remember, I think. And the theory behind the fortress uh, thing was that it doesn't have to be a total order. It can be a partial order. And the other theory was, if you didn't learn it in high school, don't depend on it. Right. But wouldn't and that- fixes, and, and fixes adding parentheses, just be clear about it. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. But, but, but one of the, the goals of, of, of fortress also, if I recall, was to have, um, to be very readable, wouldn't all of the added parentheses be wordy or get in the way? That's a matter of judgment. It's a style I've been following anyway in my C and Java programming, just so that nobody is misled. Okay. I mean, sure. I'm, we know that multiplication is high, high precedence in addition. I'm willing to rely on that. Mm -hmm. um, Exactly what happens when you mix, multiply, and divide? Well, people are a little fuzzy on that, so I tend to throw in the parentheses just to be safe. Yep. And as I say, for the relationship between a comparison and a bitwise or operation, nobody is really 100% sure of that. Might as well parenthesize that just to be safe. Okay. Um, so I think there are two questions that build on, on this uh, idea of, of syntax, uh, one from Sophia and one from uh, uh, Matt Dubinsky. 
Uh, and uh, they ask about your paper towards a more carefully specified meta notation and the keynote that you gave in 2017. It's time for a new old language. Yes. And the question is, have you gotten any closer to solving the problems you described since, you know, the, that talk and paper? Oh my, that is actually still an ongoing project, but in the background as I work on other things. Um, I think I will have more to say about it in the future if I can complete the project, uh, which is that uh, for that talk, I did a complete survey of all Popple papers. And uh, that tells me what happened in Popple. But I realized to really do it right, I really ought to look at all SIGPLAN conferences at a minimum, you gotta draw the line somewhere. And so I have uh, repeated that survey and have gone forward from 1971 to 2004. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that SIGPLAN conferences are kind of outracing me because uh, the, the proceedings are getting thicker and thicker. Yep. And so in fact, covering the last one third of that history will actually take more than half of the effort. Perhaps a sampling based approach would be well, Sufficient. perhaps that's the thing. I, I was trying to be a completist as I, as I usually am. Um, so maybe I do need to go for some sampling at this point. But uh, I've, been, I've been going through and as I have been looking at the papers, I have been constructing a database of what I've been finding. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that database may someday somehow be useful to scholars. That's a database that says, you know, for each paper that I examined, what notations I found and how they were used. And, and one has the feeling that uh, there is a lot of ad hoc notation or, you know, notational hacking just to get things to look pretty in a particular setting. Is that something you found or? Oh yeah, all the way through. I mean, that's true in mathematics too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that's how the notation grows. You know, and have, you know, and people say there really isn't a standard notation for this and I don't have to say it in words every time. So they invent something ad hoc and mm -hmm. some of them stick and others fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And that part of the process I'm not concerned about. That's a good thing. The only problem comes when you become stuck where the same notation gets used in inconsistent ways and people get confused. That's the part I'm worrying about. Okay. And eventually someone's, someone's got to make a decision or a group community has to make a decision. So Sophia asks also, does uh, do any of the ideas, so you, you were looking at notation in formal models, do any of the ideas that also carry over to programming languages in terms of you know notation. Do you see a, an applicability? Uh, well, yes. And uh, one thing that gives me um, some optimism is that perhaps my complaints will be outstripped by the growth of proof checking languages. Because a lot of what this meta notation is used for is for expressing proofs of various kinds. You know, you're expressing something formally so that you can do a proof about it. And just as we have computerized mathematical notations in languages going all the way back to Fortran, maybe we will computerize these proofs and the result will not be that we repair the problems notation, we'll just switch to a different notation that, that is executable. Yeah. And so maybe something, I mentioned cock and lean, those are actually very much in my mind, these proof checkers, uh, may be the future of programming languages. So, so to come back to Fortress, one of the things that stood out was there the emphasis on 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 formatting code, right? You 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 could, you could use sort of more like LaTeX like notation to have code that render. Was that do you feel that was a successful uh, part of the design? You... Uh, I'm not sure. I think that was, again that was something that was incomplete. I think we did our part of it completely. We did not have the chance to test it on a user community. It was back when we were proposing ideas to ARPA for the, uh, the HPCS, the High Productivity Computing Systems Project. They explicitly invited us, you know, throw your craziest ideas at us. We, we took them at their word and came up with 20 crazy ideas of which that was one of the crazier ones. Mm -hmm. And to my amazement, they were actually very enthusiastic about it, trying to make their programs look more mathematical. So we decided to push that through and carry it. It required a lot of tooling and the tooling is not widely deployed at this point. You know, to we have the support of Unicode, but we don't have a lot of support still in for uh, two-dimensional uh, display of notation. 
At one point, we found ourselves using MathJax as a way of getting Fortress code to display within browsers. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like a promising step forward. Mm -hmm. But uh, we still don't have agreement on good ways of displaying even well agreed upon two dimensional mathematical notations in all kinds of document contexts. Instead, we've got five or six of them and they don't really talk to each other. There's MathJax, there's MathML and some other things. Mm -hmm. Wish that were as well solved as, as Unicode seems to have solved the linear string problem. Okay, um, so switching topics, um, Connor Hoekstra from NVIDIA is asking the following. He's, he writes, being a prolific book author with books on Common Lisp, C, Java, and Fortran, and a PL, PL designer, creator, Scheme, Fortress, in your personal opinion, what are the most interesting languages uh, um, that have come out in the last 20 years? In other words, if you were to write another book on a newer language, which language would you write to, would you like to write about? Oh, okay. Thank you for the question. I need to begin by saying those strike, those strike me as being two extremely different questions. <laughs> because what I am competent to write about may not be the most interesting things going on. <laughs> I've been very fortunate things I've chosen to write about and have been competent to write about have proved to be interesting to other people. I just want to make clear that, that I, I think there's two different questions. Um, so we can take them one at a turn, time? Yeah, so let's, let, let's do that. Um, uh, I've actually been involved for the last three years as a co-chair of the uh, ACM History of Programming Languages Conference. And actually, rather than being enthusiastic about writing myself, I've been enthusiastic about helping 19 other sets of authors tell their stories. And so I would, and so plug, plug, you know, go, go read these papers. They just hit the ACM Digital Library last Friday. And so even though we were not able to hold that history conference this week as planned with BLDI, the papers have been published, you can go read them. And we will be working to prepare those, those conference presentations. So uh, as a just a uh, small uh, addendum, I've seen some of those papers, they look more like little books, like 150 pages long. So how, you know. That's right, Hop Popple by intent has no page limit. So mm -hmm. some of the papers are 40 pages long, some of them are 150, 160. Mm -hmm. It's whatever size story that set of authors had to tell. Mm -hmm. And some of, them are, some of them are quite thorough. And some of them have photographs and some of them have <laughs> interesting diagrams and some of them have funny stories, you know, so. They aren't just language reference manuals, they are histories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that said, um, I'm gonna mention Cock and Lean one more time. The, the, the proof checking languages uh, I think are interesting and probably what I would have liked to have had in Fortress if only I'd thought of it, you know, back in the early uh, 2000s, because we were trying to express things like um, in order to support a parallel implementation of something, we would like to guarantee that a certain operation is associative. And we tried to do that through the type system. And it turned out the type system really wasn't up to the task of expressing it the way we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Because the types had to relate, not just to the type of a single operator, but it had to relate the behavior of multiple operations. And it didn't quite do the job. And what we really needed, I think, was to present a proof that it's associative. And one can now do that in the, that style of languages. So that, that's one set of things that interests me. Um, in the area of Lisp, I've worked on all kinds of Lisps. I think what Rich Hickey has done with Clojure is very interesting. I mentioned that too uh, before. Uh, and in the way he has tried to make a Lisp-like language on the one hand relate to Java and on the other, other hand to relate to a database. So uh, I think those are interesting. Uh, the Swift language interests me very much. Rust interests me. Uh, they are using the type system in interesting ways. In, in the case of Rust, uh, trying to use uh, the type system as a way to prove that certain uh, uh, ownership properties of variables are behaved so you don't have to worry about uh, race conditions and programs. So now that I've mentioned several instances, I think I'm really interested in the idea of extending programming languages beyond type systems to prove more interesting things about their safety. I guess that general topic interests me. And so ultimately, if I were to ha have a one more book left in me, I would be interested in writing a book about a language of that kind, uh, pushing beyond type systems to, uh, to guarantee language safety properties. All right. 
Um, Thank you for dragging that answer out of me. I didn't know it five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I will switch now to a question by, um, by, by Bill Pugh. Um, so he writes, over the years, you worked on an exceptionally wide variety of topics. What are you working on now? And what is your process for identifying new topics to work on? Oh, man. Um, I've taken the Myers-Briggs type indicator and I turned out to be extreme on all four scales. And the last one is P. I'm a guy who just sits back and lets things happen to him and reacts rather than being the kind who says, you know, here's what I will work on and I'm going to plow everything, you know, bulldoze through anything that gets in my way. I feel very fortunate that just as I've looked around, I keep seeing sparkling diamonds on the ground to grab and, and try to do something with. Lots of things interest me and I'm willing to, um, in some ways I'm willing to be second banana on a lot of projects. You know, take someone else's you know, great idea and say, okay, I will work with that. I will polish it. I will crank through the 900 special cases to make sure that it's been thoroughly covered. And so uh, a lot of my projects have been like that. I didn't invent Java, but I think I helped to polish the specification. I didn't invent the idea behind connection machine list. Back to Danny Hillis came up with the idea, but then I worked out the entire theory and wrote academic papers about it. And um, just enough things interest me that I've had no shortage of interesting things to work on. So, so maybe to sort of uh, um, uh, pick up on his first, the first part of his question, uh, what are you working on now? Uh, right now I'm working on uh, getting the, a new set of random number generators into JDK 16 for Java. And uh, there's a paper I need to write about those soon. Um, and and uh, hints about these ideas have been floating around for a few years. So the, I worked with uh, actually Doug Lee and a couple other people to do the split mix algorithm for Java. And that's proved to be reasonably successful. But we discovered um, uh, that it didn't have just one weakness. It has at least three. And we defended against the one and described it in the paper we published in 2014. Uh, two others have been discovered and I wrote them up, haven't found a publication venue for that yet because just that much isn't a complete paper. And yet the replacement for it is kind of too big a paper. And in fact, we uh, submitted a paper about this and it got bounced and rightfully so, and they made me think harder about it, which is great. And so I'm working on a second version of the paper. Uh, but I've been working with a, a professor, Sebastiano Vigna over in Italy, who's been working on uh, shift XOR style generators. And we have an idea for a compound uh, of a shift XOR generator and a linear congruential generator that we think it turns out is, is quite fast, not quite as fast as split mix, but even more robust. Uh, it, we have not managed to identify any obvious weaknesses and it seems to be very robust in the face of uh, using it in parallel threads the same way you want to use a split mix. So uh, I believe that we've uh, dotted the T's and crossed the I's, swap that. And uh, uh, we are now going through the last stages of the JDK and JCP acceptance process to, and with the hope of getting into JDK 16. So you asked, that's what I've been working on pretty hard for the last several months. Okay. And to that, uh, Doug Lee adds, and what about tail calls? Question mark, exclamation mark. Tail calls, out of my hand. I'm not in the Java product organization and haven't been. I'm a frequent consultant and I talk to people like John Rose and Brian Getz and they get tired of me once a year saying, so what about tail calls? So I unfailingly remind them every so often and it's, sorry, it's not my division. I'm sure there are business priorities. They understand it'd be a good thing and uh, value types are also a good thing and record structures are a good thing. And, and uh, yeah, it's a process. I'd love to see it done. Okay. Um, then Krista Lopez uh, from UC Irvine said, you worked in many important things over the year. Is there any piece of work that in retrospect you think was a waste of your time or a bad idea? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, it's, 
it's kind of like saying, did I make the wrong move in backgammon when constantly <laughs> your decisions are based on various random things that are happening to you. Uh, no, I think, well, maybe I can think of one. I think maybe we pushed a little too hard trying to get Fortress to succeed on the J Java virtual machine. And so we worked, I, I spent more time working on that particular project and perhaps should have abandoned Fortress a year or two earlier. Nevertheless, during that year or two, we did learn some things that eventually turned into a published paper that I uh, uh, co-authored with uh, Si Kyung Ru at Keist and a couple of, who had been on the Fortress project mm -hmm. and uh, two of her students. And, uh, and uh, the two students actually uh, did a wonderful job and produced a, a publishable paper about uh, the, the type theory you developed in Fortress. So I guess I can't even say that that was wasted. Um, I spent some time working on a tickle compiler in 1994 when I first joined Sun. And just when I got it working, I discovered that, uh, that there are already two commercial entities selling the same thing. <laughs> So is that a waste of time? I don't know. I learned something about Tickle. So maybe uh, um, another sort of take on the question is, how soon can you tell that something is a bad idea? Do you have to pursue it to its end or can you feel you know, that's coming early on? Oh, well, um, it's certainly the case that uh, there have been lots of cases, not so much in the area of language design, but algorithms. I guess I'm known as a language person, but I've actually spent a fair amount of time on algorithms as well. Uh, algorithms for which I'm not particularly well known, and that's fine. Uh, but, uh, but it's something I enjoy. And when one is investigating algorithms, uh, it's important to do lots of measurement up front. You can usually tell when, when uh, you're down a false trail because it's just not panning out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've had many surprises in the form, oh, surely this will improve things by 10%. It makes it 15% worse. And, and this uh, was an experimental process. Yeah, absolutely. Experimental process. Well, experimental process aided by an analytic process that turned out to be wrong. So in some sense, uh, I don't regard anything as wasted because every failure from every failure, I learned something. Unfortunately, my failures have not been, been uh, have not wasted so much time that I haven't eventually ended up in a positive place. But, but, but certainly it's important to measure and verify, you know, and, and, and uh, if the numbers should tell you that something isn't panning out, it's time to look elsewhere. Okay. Um, there is a question from Dave Unker. He says, he says, since I worked on Swift these days, I'd be interested in your take since you said that you found it an interesting language. So I think your take on Swift. I do. Uh, unfortunately, even though I've been a Mac user for like 25 years, more than that, 30 years, 33 even years. At, even this, at some? I've been on Macs for a third of a century. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got my first Mac too in 1987. Yeah. Um, so you would think I would be up with the languages like Objective-C, but the Mac was the first computer I ever worked with, let alone owned, that I realized I was productive with without having a programming language for it. <laughs> and so, so now, now that a Mac's run on Unix, I have in fact run C code and Java code and stuff like that on it. But uh, I guess one of my failings is that I've not spent a lot of time uh, learning how to use the, um, the Objective-C and then the Swift uh, ecosystem. And it interests me very much. And I would like to uh, learn more about uh, doing UI programming in that infrastructure. And similarly, I've also failed to learn about the Windows UI infrastructure and so forth. You know, there's only so much time in a day. But, uh, but I have learned about uh, some of the Windows languages, such as C Sharp and Visual Basic and so forth. Um, so yeah, Swift interests me. And if I were to take, take you know, four, you know, a four month sabbatical and just say, I'm gonna learn a new programming language, it would probably, I would probably take the time to learn both Swift and Rust, just because I think I would learn new things from those languages that in areas that I haven't learned yet. And because they are actually, you know, in use nowadays doing interesting stuff. And there are other in languages that are in use today, uh, uh, being used for interesting stuff, but I've already spent some time learning about them. So I have another question here from Matt. Um, is moving. Matt Zibinski, 
um, and he was asking uh, about you know following up on the observations on about Koch and Lean, and he, he asked, "What are your thoughts on Idris and making dependent type system a mainstream PL feature?" Yes, I don't know much about Idris specifically. I know it's in that same uh, family of, of sort of of languages that uh, for that kind of application. Um, yes, dependent types, very important idea, I think. I know more about its use in the context of Lean than Idris. I understand that Idris came earlier. It's just a matter of what I happen to have, uh, have learned about and I'm a little ignorant of the history of development of those languages. But yes, the dependent types, I think are an exciting new idea. And I think the key to doing the kinds of proofs that I had wanted to do in Fortress and failed to have the right structure. Um, I'm reading a question from Yulia Belyakova from Northeastern. Speaking of polishing programming languages, what do you think of employing user studies as part of designing programming languages? I think ideally that would be done all the time. The problem is that they're very expensive, both in time and money. Uh, I would have, if Fortress had pushed forward, I was going to try to uh, do a substantial amount of that if it had gotten funded in the way we, we had hoped to. But that's not the, the way the way it happened. Uh, it was a competitive procurement thing. And in the third round of funding, IBM and Cray got the funding and, and uh, Sun did not. And Sun allowed me to continue to work on it, but it was sort of at a lower level of effort, but it was not the level of effort we envisioned. We had certainly envisioned to start doing that kind of user study. I think it is an important thing. But it, it seems that you know one challenge for, for programming language design is the user study comes way too late. You know, the feedback loop is, you know, maybe I don't yeah we can validate an idea but you know to to change design after you know we have built your compiler runtime libraries there's just so much investment that it seems uh yeah I mean yeah it's true and while we did not have the chance to do properly controlled scientific user studies at least with Fortress we were constantly being reviewed by a committee of potential users mm-hmm uh, from the, uh, from actually from the kind of the scientific community, community and the physics community. And so as we refined our ideas, we had to present them, you know, periodically at the, these review meetings and, uh, get feedback from them. And the one thing that really struck me was one thing we'd proposed was, uh, instead of using, uh, braces to indicate block structure, we said, uh, how about just using indentation like in Python? And we were surprised the user community was extraordinarily negative about that at that time. We said, no. Of all that you've presented, 20 crazy ideas. That's the one we don't want. It's one idea too far. Which stunned me because I thought that was actually a fairly conservative extension idea. But they said, no, we don't like that. Well, so listen to your users. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially if you want to get funded. Yep. So Connor Huckstra from NVIDIA also asked um, about the references to APL in your books and your talk, Growing a Language. He says uh, that in 2007, you gave a talk entitled, What APL Can Teach the World? Yes. I've also read that you spent time trying to combine Lisp and APL. What is your history with APL? How did you, how did you come to give your 2007 talk? Oh, goodness, that's long. Thing. I've got a long history as a distant observer of APL. I was never really a part of the APL community. But APL would have been the third programming language I learned, and in a rather strange and roundabout way. I was, um, let's see, this is spring of 1969. So I would have been uh, 69. So it would have been 14. I wasn't quite 15. And the Spring Joint Computer Conference came to Boston that year. And uh, I didn't know much about conferences, but I was hanging around with a crowd of computer geeks at Boston Latin School. And uh, it was at the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. We decided to drop in and see what the scene was. And if you want to get in and hear about the papers and so forth, that was money. But you, we could wander around on the exhibit floor where the vendors had their booths. And IBM had a rather large booth there. And they were announcing the, the APL 360 as a product. And this intrigued me. So I grabbed a couple of brochures. They had brochures with examples of the programming language. 
And uh, I, you know, I knew enough not to get in people's way. I'm just a kid, but I could lurk and listen. And I found what they were talking about you know, fascinating. And I was there at the very end of the conference as the exhibitors were beginning to break down the exhibits. And I was kind of, just kind of watching what was going on. And as they were running the examples, they were doing it on this IBM 2741 terminal, which is of course printed on paper. And this fan fold paper had accumulated over the course of three days. You know, and there was a stack about that thick. And uh, a lady who worked for IBM uh, then grabbed that fan fold paper, picked it up, and was headed for a trash spin. And I, made, I was courageous enough to say, are you gonna just throw that away? And she turned around and looked at me and grinned. She said, it's yours. <laughs> And I took three days of, of IBM demonstrations on fan fold paper home and taught myself APL from that. Plus the, plus the brochure they were handing out at the conference. And the idea of these are powerful array operations where all I knew was Fortran and IBM 1130 assembly language just had a very strong influence on me. And then a few years later, when I was a student at MIT and had an office in Technology Square as a, as a, as a, a programmer and graduate student there, it turns out that IBM had its Cambridge Research Center on a different floor of the same building. And one of those offices was occupied by a fellow named Trenchard Moore, who had written extensively on his theory of arrays. And so I learned array theory literally at Trenchard Moore's knee. We were sitting in office chairs face to face and knee to knee, and he would have his documents spread out on his knee and point to various things. You know, literally, I was learning at his knee. And... Um, that in turn had a strong influence on the design of common lisp because the one thing I insisted in the common lisp treatments was raised was get the edge cases right. That's what I learned from Trench. If you make sure the edge cases are right, then you won't have special cases in your code, in user code. And uh, ever since then, I've tried to stay in touch with the uh, development of the APL community. I've been a longtime member of SIG APL just so I could get all the documents and the, and the uh, conference proceedings. And they just had a different way of looking at things that, that I found valuable. And it was you know, different from the Algol way of looking at things, different from the Fortran way of looking at things. It was different from LISP. And so, uh, yeah, I'm an APL fan. Okay. Um, you got me going. <laughs> yep, 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 that's a that's strong endorsement. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, Eric ID from the University of Utah says, if I recall, you were a, or are a singer. Have you done anything musical since we've all been self-isolating? Some ensembles have tried to group to do group performance via Zoom, etc. Uh, have you tried anything like that? Other thoughts about music in time of isolation? Well, thank you. Well, obviously, you haven't seen the videos produced to advertise PLDI 2020 called "This Is PLDI," and in fact, I am hanging in that video. So please go to YouTube, search for, this is still PLDI. You will find the video and you will find many computer scientists singing in that video. And so, yes, that is my one attempt at doing the group video singing thing. And I am grateful for that opportunity. I would love to do more of it, but I'm just an amateur. So uh, I, as, you know, sort of watching uh, this video, I thought this puts a very high bar for future conferences, you know, like next year's PLDI, I don't know what we, we can do to, to top that. Yeah. I, have occasionally, I, when I, have, I have occasionally done musical things at prior, other conferences and get together and so forth. Um, the one that sticks out most in my mind is that when we were doing the high performance of Fortran specification and we were meeting in, in Dallas, Fort Worth every six months, I, I learned that there were a few other people, I think Rob Schreiber was one of them, uh, who were interested in musical performance. And uh, uh, we ended up doing a uh, geography fugue as we handed out the parts and performed it at one of these business meetings <laughs> just because we could. Uh, how did it go? It was called geography. It was spoken, not sung. This was all rhythmic. Uh, and the Lake Titicaca and the, and the so-and-so river. I've, I've forgotten all the words. I can't perform it for you. But if you find it, if you search for geographical fugue and, and throw in the words Lake Titicaca, you will almost certainly find this piece of, of music that we did. So I'm, I'm always interested in doing musical performance. It's, it's, it's a hobby of mine. And uh, I would love to see more of it at BLDI. So let's, uh, 
let's do these uh, virtual things while we can. And maybe somebody would like to get together a uh, an impromptu singing group at the next physical PLDI. I would join. All right. Uh, okay. So Doug Lee says, 50 in 50 from Hopl3 is one of my favorite presentations to show to students. We're, will there be a Hopl4 follow-up? Um, in Dick Gabriel. <laughs> And one of the reasons is that as co-chairs, we should not commission ourselves to do a, any kind of presentation or performance. Mm -hmm. There will be keynotes. We've lined up some really good keynotes. I don't know whether those keynote presenters are musically inclined or not. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe we should, you know, maybe you've nudged us into looking into possibly commissioning something addition. That's a great idea. But, it's, uh, uh, it, it, there's definitely popular demand. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that 50 and 50 is still well remembered after all these years. And that certainly was an opportunity for uh, Dick Gabriel and me to do various kinds of musical expression uh, of, of the weird variety. We hope in the service of raising people's uh, curiosity about some of the weirder programming languages. Mm -hmm. See, things I love all programming languages. There are certain tasks I wouldn't do in some of them, but I really relish the opportunity to write a, in earnest, write a program in Shakespeare that would do something non-trivial and be an iambic pentameter. You know, that was kind of a cool thing to do. And other people have done other things. Uh, there is um, there is a wonderful thing, piece that's come out. There's, there's, I'm blanking on the name of the Japanese person who has constructed um, circular quines, which are is a program written in a programming language whose output is a program in a different programming language which when run, whose output is a program in a different programming language, and it eventually closes the loop. And he has, over the years, built up a loop of 128 programming languages. And as you run each program, it outputs a program in the next programming language, a very different structure, it looks very different. And you, when you realize that each of these 128 programming languages has buried in it the knowledge of the syntax of all 128 languages, the, the achievement is really stunning. Wow. Um, all right. So I think that we're getting probably at the end of our time. Um, so uh, I'll just add last finish with a question by uh, Sophia, who says, how long is that program that you just mentioned? And does it Thank grow you. with each PL added? I'm sorry, uh, I got a notification. Someone has just posted the name of that Japanese uh, programmer, uh, Yusuke Endo. Yes. Yes. So yeah, yeah, check that out. And someone has posted the pointer to this is still PLDI. So I don't have to promise to do that at this point. That's been posted. Everybody can enjoy those two things. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. So back to the question you were asking. Oh, uh, Sophia was asking: Is the program growing as new programming uh, languages are added, or is it? The program is surprisingly small. Mm -hmm. the, the, the the initial program that it starts with, it's it's you know, like twenty thousand characters or so. It's not it's not huge. Mm -hmm. okay. And furthermore, uh, it is laid out with white space in such a way as to make a picture of an Ouroboros swallowing its tail. <laughs> and the guy is a true artist. It's, it's fantastic. Yep. Okay. So there's a link now uh, from uh, that's all to the too. program. Yep. 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 All right, Guy, uh, anything else that you, you would like to add? Any last thoughts? I'm excited that there are more things going on in programming language design today than I can possibly know about. I mean, I, I'm a dilettante. I like to learn about as many different languages as I can, which means I'm awfully shallow on some of them. But I'm delighted by the variety, and I'm delighted that other people are are being, uh, on the one hand, very pragmatic engineers, on the other hand, being artistically creative with them. And I think there's there's still a lot more potential in the design of programming languages, as as applications evolve and as people's creative spirit moves them. So, I'm a happy camper. Thank you, and thanks for asking these great questions. All right. Thanks a lot for coming and I'll do the virtual clap or, or I'll just clap. <laughs> I clap for the audience. Thank you. Yes. Thank you whoever joined. Nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Th thank you everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.